Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Tempe City Council work study session. Item number one is called order. Council meetings can be watched in real time via Cox Cable Channel 11 and at tempe.gov slash tempe11. Members of the public may also attend the meeting virtually through Microsoft Teams. Guidelines for conduct at City Council meetings are on the table near the entrance for those in attendance at tonight's meeting. We will now play a video with the proper conduct for ensuring the appropriate conduct at City Council meetings. I guess so, yeah. Yeah. Can you just put up a big sign that says, be nice? I could wear a t-shirt <laughs> that says that. Be nice. I had a... The City of Tempe welcomes public comment at this time. Disruptive behavior will not be allowed. Continued disruptive behavior will lead to removal from the council chambers. We need to be able to hear everyone in the room. Behavior that disrupts, disturbs, or otherwise impedes the orderly conduct of any city council meeting is not helpful and is not permitted. This includes behavior both inside and outside of the council chambers. Should individuals inside the council chambers become disruptive so that city business is not able to be conducted, the mayor will first ask that the individuals allow city business to be completed. There will be time for public comment during the call to the audience portion of the meeting. If no cooperation, the mayor will issue a verbal warning and let them know that the continued disruptive behavior will lead to removal from the council chambers. If there is still no cooperation, the mayor will issue a second verbal warning and let them know that the continued disruptive behavior will lead to removal from the council chambers. If there is no cooperation after asking and two verbal warnings, then the mayor will ask security officers to remove only those individuals who are causing the disruption. Security personnel should not engage in any way, but only escort them from the council chambers. If individuals refuse to leave, security personnel shall warn them that they are trespassing and that the next step will be arrest by a Tempe police officer. Tempe officers may have to arrest if individuals refuse to leave. Charges for trespass and disorderly conduct may apply, as well as other charges. Should anyone be asked to be removed, the mayor will recess the meeting. Thank you so much. Just as a note, too, for those watching at home, uh, Vice Mayor Adams is also online just to... Just so you all know, we have four people here. Next up, item number two, call to the audience. The City Council welcomes public comment at this time for the issue review study session and Committee of the Whole items on this work study session agenda. There is a three minute time limit per speaker. Madam Clerk, do we have any cards? I do not have any requests to speak for this meeting. Okay, sounds good, thank you so much. Uh, is there anyone in the audience who'd like to address the council on any of the agenda items? If so, please get my attention. Seeing none, I will flip forward and move to item number 3A, which is Mill Avenue Streetscape, University Drive to Rio Salado Parkway. And I don't know we're going to have staff come down as long, along with a consultant from J2 for a presentation on this item. I see Eric and Shelly. There's three of us. And I, Eric, Shelly, a clicker. In the middle. All right, I think we're ready. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Shelley Seiler, Interim Engineering and Transportation Director. And I'm Eric Iverson, the Sustainability and Resilience Director. I'm Jeff Velasquez, Landscape Architect with J2 Design. So we always like to highlight uh, which performance measures the project is going to help advance, and so you can see some of those on the screen. I won't directly read them, but there are many others also that were helping to advance. So just a little bit about what we're gonna be discussing tonight. In June, we were in front of you uh, presenting hardscape and tree concepts. Uh, the council narrowed the hardscapes from five down to three and the tree uh, concepts from three to two. Tonight, we are only going to be presenting to you on the hardscape sidewalk and we will be returning on October 19th to discuss trees. Uh, we'll go over the public feedback summary and takeaways, the staff recommendations, and then timeline and next steps. And we're tag team in this presentation. That's why there's three of us. So a couple things, uh, again, kind of on the history of this project um, before we get into some of the concepts. Uh, we just want to remind uh, the council and the public that this is an infrastructure project as part of the Refresh Tempe. And really, there's a ton of stuff that's happening under the street. 
and those are listed here. And so while we're doing that, we want to combine that work with what's happening on top of the street. And that's really the aesthetics of the street is really what we're here to talk about and what we have been talking about, what we've been talking about with the public. So all those items you can see here. So we're looking at tonight specifically, as Shelley said, um, the sidewalk treatments and what concept we want to advance um, into formal construction documents. But all the other things like seating, ADA improvements, um, really the enhancement of that public space, um, are going to be part of what gets designed into the Mill Avenue project. We want to reassure you of that. And then really, because this is such an important project for the whole city, for the whole community, we want to make sure that you're aware that we're looking at all the different um, stories that can be told through the street. I mean, we're familiar with some of the um, elements that are out there today, like the Walt Richardson plaque, but we really want to bring out, and that's what we've been hearing from the boards and commission and the stakeholders, is telling that whole story of Tempe, who we are, from the indigenous uh, communities that were here first to contemporary Tempe. And then this is the project area, you're all familiar, but we're looking at a half mile of street on Mill Avenue from Real Soto Parkway down to uh, south at University Drive. We have engaged, um, we almost need two slides for this, we have engaged multiple uh, stakeholder teams, you can see those listed here. Many different departments are part of the project uh, design direction, and then we're also working with J2 from uh, as our design team consultant, and then we continue to, Shelley and I continue to go to different boards and commissions and make sure that they're getting their, their say in what happens with this street. And uh, the highlighted or the bold portion of the schedule is really where we're at now. We're seeking direction from you all um, on the sidewalk treatments. We will be back um, in the next couple weeks to determine the tree selection, tree palette, plant palette design, um, and those dates are here. We want to also mention that in, in an effort to be really efficient with the timeline that we are continuing to develop the construction documents on all those things that are happening under the road and the things that we know we have to do. And then we fill in the pieces of what kind of trees, what kind of sidewalk with those construction documents. So we're working on those now. J2 is putting those together now. In fact, I think next month we will have the 60% plans for this. <clears throat> Public outreach, so we have detailed a lot of the different teams that we've gone to to uh, seek feedback on the project. This is a little bit more specific about what we did in the last several months. So a very typical treatment to what you see for all of our capital projects. Worked with Sean and Warner's team um, and had extensive outreach. Worked with DTA uh, to get ex extensive outreach uh, with all the merchants downtown. Lots of different social media, public meetings. Uh, the online Tempe forum, we gathered a ton of feedback with that, with that tool as well. Um, and we have that survey open for uh, the, the dates that you see here. And again, we continue to go to the boards and commissions to get their feedback. And uh, as part of the outreach, we shared uh, tree palette. We also shared the sidewalk concept. So um, we are, you know, we're looking at the, the brick. That's what we're talking about, the brick sidewalks that are there today. Um, we want to just remind the public and remind you all what we shared in the way of the three concepts um, in the next several slides um, before we go into exactly what was selected of those three. So we did present three sidewalk concepts per your direction in June. And then Jeff Laskin with J2 is going to detail what those were that we shared in the public. Thanks, Process. Eric. Um, so just a real brief overview. Concept one from this summer, Streetscape concept one was basically a field of uh, modular unit pavers in a brick kind of tan pattern with two ribbons of lithocrete in blue and salvage reused brick kind of banding through with corners of exposed aggregate concrete with some medallions sprinkled in. Concept two was basically a field of reused brick, kind of salvage reused. All of these have a good uh, sub base underneath the sidewalk for, for an excellent system that won't sink. Uh, the corners would be where some of the kind of uh, enhanced areas are. That's plank pavers kind of paying tribute to Fifth Street and Farmer uh, down the street with some mosaics at the corners to celebrate Tempe and some of the history. And concept three was more kind of a pattern or a rhythm um, that was salvaged, reused brick with a pattern of those plank pavers running perpendicular to the curb and the street. Um, not a whole lot of color, not a whole lot of flash on number three, really kind of a simplified uh, streetscape concept. So the results, uh, we again took out those three concepts and other and, and received a ton of feedback. Um, essentially what you see here, a couple takeaways that we want to highlight is that we heard from all over our community. So the map you can see 
Um, the distribution of comments that we heard from, we're really happy about that. I think 97% of the comments or 96% of the comments came from Tempe residents. So people were really active in this. We had hundreds of votes. Um, happy about that. This is something important to folks. And then i um, not going to go into too many details on the chart that's here, um, but we essentially it was a ranked choice voting. Um, concept one, which was the more elaborate one that Jeff just walked us through, and concept two were the highest vote getters. So that was the traditional brick and then the more elaborate one of concept one. When you average everything out, the traditional brick really was the prevailing concept. And so in looking at that, um, the strength really of concept one and the strength of concept two, we also wanted to note that concept one got the most least favorite votes as well. So they got kind of the, the highest number of third place votes. So we wanted to kind of balance that out. And in doing that, we um, design team and, and uh, um, taking all that information, I think next slide, we, uh, as I mentioned, we want to recognize the strength of both of them. And so we are looking for, um, and what you'll see in the, in the upcoming slides, is integrating the strengths or the things that we heard from the public which were, which were liked about concept one and integrate that in with the, the, um, the elegance and the iconic simplicity of that brick um, and really keep that brick as we heard a ton of support for that, keep that as really the prevailing design theme on the street sidewalk and integrate in some of the color and some of the important elements that people liked in concept one. So that's kind of how we're moving forward with this. And then again, telling the story um, or fleshing out some of the more details of like seating and shade structures and public art history, those are things that can come later and will add to um, that character of downtown Tempe. And in, in doing that, we also want to remind you all, we continue to look at all the things that influence uh, the story of Tempe and really the story of Mill Avenue. So the image here is some of the things that we've heard and some of the things that we think are really important for us to continue to draw from, reflect upon as we put, put the construction documents together. So we have four <coughs> images that we'll share with you that reflect uh, the concept two enhancement that has been uh, at least recommended to date. This first view is a view at uh, Fifth and Mill looking northwest and it shows in the foreground there at the corner a medallion that could speak to the history and some of the character of, of Tempe, along with the plank pavers running at a diagonal. Um, all of that little detail isn't kind of dialed in yet, but that's kind of the, the direction that those are, are sitting right now. <clears throat> then in the distance, you have the street tree system, along with uh, brick pavers really taking on the majority of the field as you go up the street. On the next view, this is kind of uh, from block to block, really other than the corners. You're going to have a, a, a block of a lot of the recycled brick with the street tree system, we haven't really worked out all the planters and furnishings yet, but this is a good view showing at least the hardscape sidewalk system as a main kind of uh, main field down the streetscape. Third view is looking back, looking south southwest at the same fifth and mill as an example, showing the kind of nice what we're calling kind of living room area, welcoming you to the corner. There's a bump out that were, it was in all of the concepts. These the red parking zones really kind of bump out to shorten the length of the crosswalks. And then you see the field of brick continuing as you um, see the right side of the photo. And then the final view kind of shows that transition with a banding of concrete that locks in the brick and paver systems. And then the brick takes off to the next block. This is Muriel. <laughs> right. so, I'll take this one. <laughs> um, so again, as you've heard us throughout the presentation, we're, we're looking at um, the brick being the major theme of the sidewalk, integrating in some of those elements that we heard support for from concept one, some of those new concrete unit pavers, and the litho mosaic, uh, which gives us an opportunity to do storytelling and really highlight some more of those things that are culturally important to us as a community. Um, and we will continue to flesh those out as we go through the process in the next couple of months and, and give you all an opportunity, and the public an opportunity, to look at that once we pull it all cohesively together. Thanks. Yep. So next steps, uh, October 19th, again, we will be returning to you with the tree concepts. We are working towards those 60% plans and expect those in October. And then like Eric said, we'll return to you in December or January with when we have all of the elements fleshed out so that you can see really what the future holds for Mill Avenue. And then February, we plan to have 100% ps and es plan specs and estimates, and hopefully starting construction in February, March. And with that, we're happy to answer any questions.
Thank you so much. Appreciate the presentation. Just one question on my end. When we talk about recycled brick, I know that's a term that's being used a lot. How are we making sure that the brick looks clean? Because that's one of the things that I get from residents often and, and merchants, and I also see it myself being a downtown resident, is you know, people will say many times, well, you know, how come we don't power wash the bricks more? And I'm like, well, no, the, the bricks are actually power washed quite frequently on a regular schedule, and uh, DTA does a great job with that. But sometimes it's just the bricks at some point are just older, and so they just have this sort of dingy or darker appearance, even though they are being properly maintained. So my question is, you know, going with that, how do we ensure that those bricks don't, in three or four years, begin to look dingy in a way where they can't be freshened up or brightened up? You want me to take out one? Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, good question. Um, we'll be working with a contractor who's actually here, Aiken Gardner Construction. Um, as the plans progress, we're going to be sitting down with uh, methods and means and talking about the detail of how we pull this off with the contractor. I believe when we pull those pavers out, they're going to have to be power washed, cleaned, stored off-site, and an evaluation of the strength of those pavers and which ones are in good condition will be evaluated probably pretty meticulously. And the ones that are able to be put back will be put back, others will be discarded. And there may be some imported brick mixed in that looks you know, really good and, and blends in well that might have to take place with the, the install. But we'll be sure to make sure that it is gonna look good when it goes in for sure. And we'll continue to the, the power washing that happens. I believe it's daily. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. On the street. So that will help. But, you know, new material um, will make a big difference. Sounds good. Thank you. Anyone else? Council Member Garland? I, I love the idea and how um, many people were able to take part in giving you some ideas for this. I'm comfortable with the final decision or at least the look of what you're looking at. My, my only concern, and I love the idea about reusing the bricks. Um, again, it's on a sustainability thing. Um, and, and it really is iconic to who Tempe is. The, for me, and maybe some other people that wear heels occasionally, you know, the brick seems to cause problems. And that's why I kind of like the other ideas that we had looked at before because it, it's, it's not brick that can move and wobble. And, so, are, we, are there new technologies that we can use that makes the brick more stable, that we won't have those problems of wobbly bricks or bricks, can they be replaced quickly if one gets a chip and has a hole in it? I'm just curious about that. You want me to take I'd like to say something really quick. So <laughs> I just want to say this is definitely something that we heard from through the public process okay. and with some of our boards and commissions, particularly the Mayor's Commission on Disability Concerns. And we do have, um, Jeff's probably going to hopefully not disagree with me on this, but we do have new installation methods that hopefully will make this Great. more stable. Um, and again, new construction, it's going to be better than hopefully what we had 40 plus years ago when this was originally put in. So I think some of, a lot of that will help address um, some of the concerns you have. But we hear you and we're moving forward with that uh, in mind. And that's also why we put, as part of this, inf the, one of the slides mentioned that it's an infrastructure project. We want to make sure that we're enhancing and improving the ADA conditions that are out there today, which will which will address the issue that you're talking about. Okay, yeah. But you yeah, just to, to answer your question, below the brick layer, we're not going to get into much detail in respect <laughs> of your time here, but there'll be a, a concrete slurry, basically oh, almost great. like a soil cement, four or six inches below oh, with okay. an inch of sand on top for leveling. That's really hopefully never going to settle. Mm -hmm. um, we've done that in other downtowns and high traffic areas in eight to ten years. It's really holding up well. Mm -hmm. So I think we're going we're gonna to nail that you know, with your team here really okay, well. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And I, and I do like that. I do like the, the look and the color of that because it, it doesn't draw your eye so much on to what you're walking on, but it gives you the opportunity to look around also. The other ones with the lines and things going through it, it just seemed kind of busy. This is simple and really beautiful. So thank you. Sounds good. Thank you. Anyone else? Sounds good. Wonderful. Thank, thank you. you so much. So thank love you. the love the accelerated timeline as well. Yeah. Love the fact that we're talking about early 2024. So yes. thank you. Yeah. Thanks. All right. That takes us to item 3B, making space an equity study for City of Tempe Parks and Recreation. Love the shirts. Oh. In the middle. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you for inviting us up to share our progress on the Making Space and Equity Study for Tempe Parks and Recreation. Sean Wagner, Deputy Sean Wagner, Deputy Community Services Director, and I'm joined tonight by Aaron Kirkpatrick and Mercedes Payne, two of our Community Services Managers and Project Leads, as well as Anna Layborn with Design Workshop, our uh, Lead Project Consultant. 
Making Space an Equity Study for Tempe Parks and Recreation, it's an initiative that we've undertaken as a division to understand how our parks and recreation spaces and places are accessed and experienced. Understanding the historic and current uses allows us to recognize gaps in service. Um, and then how can we then adjust and modify our planning efforts, our staffing efforts, and our programming efforts to address these uh, real and perceived gaps? We have provided council updates, packet updates throughout this journey, and previously updated you in April on our efforts to learn and evaluate through a comprehensive analysis, analysis that was rooted in robust uh, community engagement. This included an overall assessment of data highlighting the inequities and experiences as well as infrastructure and service investment and functionality. Today, we are excited to present our initial draft plan, including the principles, goals, and strategies that will guide up our plan of action moving forward, including a few key deliverables, community navigators, equity priority zones, as well as the equity investment matrix that will be highlighted later in this presentation. This study touches upon each of our council's strategic priorities, but as a division, we are responsible for the three shown here. Okay. Um, today, we will give a brief overview of the project, update you on the overall analysis and community engagement process, walk through the draft of the story map while focusing on some of the recommended strategies that help support equitable provisions across our system, and look forward to your feedback on the overall organization and presentation of the analysis. Our goal with this study was to center the voices of our diverse community here in Tempe to ensure that Tempe Parks and Recreation programs and spaces are barrier-free, uh, accessible, inclusive, just, and built upon the interests and needs of people who have historically been excluded from the process. Our outreach strategies were guided by the Equity and Action Plan, and our engagement for this study was focused and high quality. We reached people that we've never heard from as a division before. Um, for example, one in five of the people that responded to our overall community survey have never um, engaged with a public process before um, in the city. Since we last presented in April, we worked closely with the Sustainability and Resilience and the Community Arts teams to host a Making Space Fest in May, creating a public meeting experience that centered organizations, vendors, and partners that represent some of the goals of this project, both in terms of opportunities and services. We hired peer solutions to focus on youth engagement and interpret our overall public survey to be more approachable for youth and teen participants. AHA Alliance completed their audit of our recruitment, hiring, training, and retention processes for the Parks and Recreation Division as a whole. And we continue to work with community navigators who've been invaluable through this process, performing park and facility assessments, gathering public feedback, and hyping the study all over town. These ambassadors will continue to assist us as we bring the draft for public comment through the month of October. Okay. I want to start out by praising the city for just undertaking this uh, follow-up to the Parks and Recreation Master Plan. Uh, cities are increasingly acknowledging that their plans were created with a lack of representational input and gaps in understanding diversity of needs. By making this an independent study, not only were those gaps filled, but new tools were forged that will continually benefit the whole of the city for years to come. The eagerness and inventiveness of your parks and recreation staff to try new methods of engaging the diversity of the community was truly exceptional. I lead a team of consultants that design workshops that give focus to equity in public investments, public spaces, and wellness services. The plans we create have been honored by dozens of awards, such as Salt Lake City, Denver, Chattanooga, Spokane, and Vancouver, BC. An important aspect we observed is different in Tempe is how strictly people stick to neighborhood enclaves for accessing parks and recreation. This means the approach that we took for geographic examination really matters, and it needs to be precisely evaluated. So introducing the organization of the study findings and walking you through the story map, this format allows the reader to navigate to and through parts of the plan that are most interesting to them. With links to memos and analysis, it provides a deeper dive into background and data from the effort without overwhelming the reader with content. So section one, the learn section, functions as the executive summary, explains some of the history of the project as well as the history of the parks and recreation in Tempe, 
defines terms, introduces project teams, and explains why an evaluation of equity is important in this context. Section two, the evaluate section of the story map, is where you'll find the summary of our overall methodology and collected data for the four equity analysis factors shown here. Each of these analyses was conducted with an eye to the equity in the data itself. For example, rather than looking at the service area of a given park at the center of a half mile radius circle, our access analysis looked at whether a canal or a highway or a block well a wall fell into that radius, thus prohibiting access to the facility. These analyses are grouped thematically to identify areas of Tempe where community members may be experiencing poor living conditions, impacts to health and wellness, lack of physical access to parks and recreation facilities, impacts from climate change, and lack of investment in parks and recreation infrastructure, as well as areas that may be poised to experience high levels of focus use due to population growth. Our evaluate section has a grand total of 14 mapped analyses. But in the interest of time, I'll just review one of the underlies all the rest, our equity priority zones. The data sets shown here were compiled from the social economic equity analysis to identify areas of the city where community members may be experiencing high levels of inequality. The darkest areas are our areas in need of very high and high equity priority. When overlaid with other mapped analysis, it becomes clear what types of investment can be made in specific areas. So the actions we take in the areas identified as equity priority zones will be influenced by our six overarching principles. A helpful tool to remember these principles is the acronym SPACES. <laughs> so S, spaces and programs for all. Parks and recreation spaces and programs are designed for inclusion and belonging. Staff reflect the val values of diversity, equity, and inclusion. P, prioritize equity. Investments and opportunities are targeted in equity priority zones through the in equity investment matrix I'll show in a moment. DEI metrics are utilized to track progress to achieving stated goals. A, active, vibrant, and diverse opportunities. Spaces are flexible, multi-use, and repurposed. Programs are developed to promote social interactions. C, customize experiences. Create and redesign spaces and amenities that are unique, communicative, climate conscious, and distinct. E, expanded access. Create long-term goals and targets for expanding and addressing space to serve a growing population. Expand programming and standards that focus on equity and growth. And last, safe environments. Collaborative with partners, promote community engagement, and design spaces with safety in mind. Demonstrate high quality and care. So please keep in mind that these graphics represent dozens of pages of information. Each of the 21 goals and related strategies underlying these priorities is a call to action to create a collaborative, welcoming, and just parks and recreation system for Tempe. So the equity investment matrix, it allows us to intentionally deliver on our second guiding principle, prioritize equity. Defining how we focus attention and fill identified gaps in service while remaining flexible and adaptive to our strategies to meet community needs with their input. So when we started crafting the goals for the study, developing an investment strategy that recognized not only our existing parks and recreation system, but allows for expansion. That was a key part of that deliverable. Tempe has many diverse and geographic specific needs, and it was initially really difficult to organize our data to zip codes or random geographic boundaries. So we decided to look towards one of our planning tools that has helped to organize the city already, the character areas. Organizing our data this way helps us to capture some of the unique pressures faced in different areas of the Tempe. We are organizing our equity factors on the left and identifying a score for each by character area. As shown in the key at the top of the slide, the more green you see, the less of a gap for a specific factor. For example, if you were to look at promoting our recreation programs, we may try some new programming in our downtown and Apache areas but would focus strategies for pocket or linear park development in the Alameda area. We look forward to the future of staff using this tool, 
one of many, to take action and bring forward items for your consideration immediately and over the long term. Equitable parks and recreation systems are intentional. And with this plan, we intend to provide direction and support for proactive CIP and operations planning, utilizing data-driven findings, as well as public input into our decision-making. Thank you for allowing us the time tonight to present this draft plan. We continue to engage with our boards and commissions, uh, and we'll be bringing the updated plan to the public for comment October 16th through the 31st, after which we'll be seeking formal council adoption and approval later this fall. We appreciate any comments or questions you have at this time. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Councilmember Keedy. Thank you, Mayor. I don't have any questions. I just this is a great presentation, great work. Looking forward to formally adopting it um, after the public feedback. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. Councilmember. Councilmember Carl. I loved reading through this packet. This made me so happy because this is exactly what the city of Tempe is. We're all about equity and making sure that we're inclusive to everybody. And this just is just another one of those incredible examples. And I was looking on um, slide four um, the, that you had that talked about your outreach and all, and all the areas that you went to. And I, that was just incredible about how many different people in different areas that you were really looking to, um, to make some of these decisions and to find your way in this decision. Yeah. Find on slide four. I, I was just impressed with the, the youth engagement that you had on there, that you were looking at staff, you were talking to neighborhoods. And you're right, each one of our parks are unique because they're in very unique neighborhoods. I'm glad you um, referenced the um, going back and looking at the character areas because that's really, I think, important. And our parks are, are what build help build our community and bring people together. So being able to make this a, a welcoming place for people of all types of people that can get there, I, I, I was just so incredibly impressed. And then um, looking at your evaluation on um, the slide number seven and how you guys really dialed it down to um, really the, the priorities that we were talking about, looking at these maps was amazing. I spent a lot of time on that, except I printed it out really small. And I, so I had not only glasses, I had to use a little more help. But anyway, it was amazing and impressive. Thank you so much for what you're doing. And along with Councilmember Keating, I look forward to what this is going to look like after you talk to our residents again about it. So thank you. Thank you. Sounds good. Uh, I don't have anything else. They've actually said what I was going to say. I think it's a great presentation, and I'm really glad that we're using this tool uh, moving forward. And I actually am I'm very, very much looking forward to formal council adoption. And I just think, once again, it speaks very highly uh, to our city, frankly, but obviously what our values are as a community as a whole. So I'm very excited about this, and I appreciate all the work that's gone into creating it. So thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. And I like your T-shirts. <laughs> and then there's that. <laughs> okay, we need some help. All right. Next up, item 3C, Pavement Quality Index Acceleration Program. All right, Tom and Isaac, welcome. Hi, good evening. Good evening, Mayor, members of the City Council. Isaac Shavira, Interim Engineering and Transportation Deputy Director. And with me? Tom Dunsing, um, Chief Deputy City Manager. Nice to be here this evening. Mayor, members of the City Council, this evening we're going to provide an overview and update on our current average PQI score on the city street network and a four-year acceleration model as well along with it as part of the implementation. This evening, Mayor and members of the City Council will be seeking direction as well on whether to increase the funding request that directly impacts the city's PQI score in the 2425 CIP, which as you know is funded via the general obligation bonds, which Tom will be speaking to a little bit further in the presentation. As part of this presentation, uh, we'll be summarizing current conditions of our payment network, our acceleration plan, and the general obligation bond needs. And as you and the public are very well aware, this council priority uh, performance measure 1.22 is to achieve our pavement quality index of 70 or higher. In this case, we're shooting for high. So we'll walk you through the current conditions of our pavement network. As you can see in the uh, upper right-hand corner, our, our existing current PQI is at about 60, 61. 
Um, we, we like to use the 60 only because um, that's what's forecasted and we haven't surveyed yet uh, our entire segments. However, our existing current PQI is at 60. And then the breakdown uh, are as follows in the arterial collector and locals. As part of the entire network of 1,312 uh, lane miles of our system, as you could see the breakdown in the chart, 20% uh, of those fall in excellent, uh, which is 80% or higher. Following that is our good uh, pavement structure, which is about 34% uh, of our uh, uh, infrastructure. And then fair to poor is less than 60 pavement quality index, uh, which is about 589 lane miles. So the current condition of the pavement network as it relates to the uh, uh, PQI and the acceleration as to where we're at currently, for end of fiscal year 22-23, like I said, the existing PQI is at 60, which is ahead of prediction 60-61, like I talked about briefly, um, just because our forecast is about 60. Once we're surveyed, we should be at about 61. Our current trajectory, however, will miss that target, target by 2028, um, just because of the inflation uh, is outpacing our uh, budget, is outpaced by our budget. We're on the right path, however, um, and need uh, adequate funding to continue the acceleration, which we'll talk a little bit further in the presentation. In terms of the uh, acceleration plan and funding, the plan will uh, basically as you can see on the map, the mill and overlays is probably the, the higher extensive work that we'll be performing on our uh, arterials and residentials. Um, that consists of mill and overlays, about 639 lane miles of mill and overlays. And then the rest of the uh, work that we'll be doing is primarily um, uh, pavement preservation, and that consists of fog seals, slurry seals, cape seals, et cetera. And then the remaining that's not highlighted on, highlighted on the map is about 10% of the network that we've already touched within the last two to three years. In terms of the funding, the cost above, as you see in, in the uh, itemized uh, budget years, um, it does include the cost of construction, the contingency funding, design services, as well as construction services that will be needed um, as part of this plan. The locations that are not highlighted on, on this map, um, like I said earlier, have, have already been treated and are, and are not part of this ask. However, the next slide will talk a little bit more about the uh, uh, pavement preservation moving forward once we achieve this 82 uh, pavement quality index. The, pre the predicted PQI at the end of this uh, um, plan is to reach the 82 pavement quality index, and that's the target that we're trying to achieve. Yes, Councilor yeah. Garlic. So that 82% is because 20% is already like excellent now and those probably won't be addressed? So Councilman Garlic, a good question. As part of our forecast in our uh, system, we basically said, how do we get to a pavement quality index of 82? And the system basically kicks back the numbers that you see on your right-hand side. If we say there's $47 million per year, 82 is the pavement quality index that it's going to give us at the end of four years. So once we get to the, to the 2028 fiscal year of the four years, that's the PQI that the system is forecasting for us in order for us to get to that, uh, to that pavement quality index at the end of the 188, 2028. Does that make sense? Okay. So moving on in terms of the uh, Preventative maintenance, uh, I think you've all seen this uh, deterioration curve, which is an important uh, piece that, for the most part, we're currently working in the uh, right half of the uh, chart. With this plan, we will move towards the left-hand side of this uh, chart, which is obviously operating and working within the excellent and good condition of our pavement, which requires less uh, budget to be able to maintain. Um, this budget, once we get, or this um, chart, once we get to that 82 uh, pavement quality index, I like to say that we put it in cruise control 
and we uh, look at making sure that we're preserving our pavement at a lot lower cost than it would to do the mill and overlays. And um, I'm gonna turn it over to Tom to talk about the uh, funding. Great, thank you, Isaac. Um, so this next slide, how do we pay for this? How do we pay for $188 million in um, PQI acceleration over four years? Um, typically for, for any, C or not for any CIP, but typically for street CIP projects, what we do is we issue GO bonds. And those GO bonds are issued over 20 years. So that's the assumption we used in these numbers you're gonna be seeing. Um, additionally, um, this 188 million, we already have about 53.9 million programmed in our CIP. So the increase funding is really what we're here to talk about um, this evening. So we already have 53.9 program in our CIP. So we would be going for an additional 134.6 million in geo bond issuances. There's a couple things that we have to look at with geo bonds. We are limited by the state constitution on how much um, we can have, how much debt we can have outstanding with geo bonds, affectionately known as the six and 20. Um, we work closely with our investment banker. Um, we don't feel that's gonna be an issue at all um, over the next four years. Um, so we're good there. We also have to go out and get voter authorized um, approval. We have a scheduled November 2024 ballot election. And if we get direction to proceed forward, we would include this additional funding request in our upcoming CIP. And then that would be included on the November 2024 ballot. And let me talk just a second about timing of this. So we've got the costs beginning in fiscal 24, 25. The ballot election is not until halfway through that fiscal year. So I just wanna um, ensure that council understands that we can't go out July 1st, 2024 and start really leaning into this. We have to wait for that, that bond election in November, but just for illustration purposes, just easier for us to show that this additional request, if we get direction by council, will we'll begin in fiscal 24, 25. A couple other things, um, we also have to look at, we've got a property tax stabilization policy and I've got a slide on that. And basically what that policy does is it ensures that the property owners in Tempe, their property tax levy, the city portion of the property tax levy remains relatively stable. There is a, the policy does say we can increase it by CPI up to a certain percentage, um, but we also have to take that into consideration because to, addition, to issue additional bonds over and above what we already have scheduled that fall within that property tax stabilization policy, we'll have to come back to council to amend that policy to be able to accommodate issuing these, uh, these bonds. Next slide, Isaac. Just let me spend just a minute on this. Um, again, bonds are paid through property taxes. And I talked a little bit about the stabilization policy. If we go through and stack on top of our, our current geo bond program, an additional $134 million, our estimates, and this, these are estimates on a, on a median single family home, will be an annual increase of $81 per year. Now, depending on the timing of these issues, that $81 is a pretty conservative estimate. That assumes we issue $134 million today would, would get to 81 million. My, I would anticipate that we would grow into that, 80, that $81 per year for that single, uh, or that single family home. Um, the one thing is um, this little chart on the left, we go through the municipal budget office, goes through and we benchmark um, city services. That's property taxes our residents pay, that sales taxes our residents pay, and the utility bills, the water, sewer, and solid waste. The property tax portion of those costs, you'll see is the, is the box on the left. And currently Tempe is the highest for our property tax levies that we make. And again, we're looking at a median single family home in Tempe. And if you stack an additional $81, we would remain the highest. But to get a really fair comparison, what we do is you look at all the costs in this analysis, and that's the, that's the box on the right. So currently Tempe is fourth in our cost of service report, um, just above Chandler, Gilbert, and Scottsdale. 
we proceed forward with this and the assumption is that the, the, the property tax would go up, the levy would go up by $81, it would move us basically from fourth to fifth is what this, this, um, this chart shows. Next slide. Now, this is a um, sort of an illustration, well, a simple illustration of a, of a bond authorization that we would um, be going out to the voters. Um, we don't need to make a decision on this particular issue tonight, but I did want to tee it up for council because we would be coming back to council um, for direction on how do we want to structure our ballot. And so currently, um, streets and PQI um, on this example um, are included in the street improvements and storm drains ballot questions, number five on the left. If we if we get direction to go forward and lean into our PQI, we have two options on our ballot. We could add it to that question number five, or we could create a completely separate question number six that's just for our PQI acceleration program. Again, um, we're not looking for direction on this tonight. This can go many different ways. We have to get our attorneys involved on how we, how we um, word our ballots that go out in November 2024, but we did want to bring it to council's attention. So with that, really, this presentation is, um, is really for, to allow staff to proceed forward and really lean into the PQI over the next four years. Again, what Isaac talked about, going um, above our, our target of 70 to 82. Um, the direction we're seeking tonight is pretty simple. Should staff come back and include PQI acceleration in our upcoming CIP process? When, if we get that direction, there is the whole other side of it of going through um, the bond authorization process, um, what that looks like. There's going to be outreach and a whole lot of steps, but it really begins tonight. Do you want to provide staff with a direction to proceed with this program? knowing what the, what the estimated property tax impact will be on, on how we pay these back. And with that, uh, Mayor and Council, Isaac and I would be more than happy to answer any questions. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Council Member Garland. Lean, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Please lean. I think, you know, we, the three of us sitting here on, on the dais right now, have been knocking on thousands of doors in the last few months and I, I have not been out in the community once without somebody, at least one person, talking to me about the conditions of our roads. Um, either the, the potholes or that we've you know, put so many Band-Aids on it, we can, where can you put another Band-Aid? So I, I, think, I think accelerating this and taking it to the voters, I think this is gonna be something that they're gonna be really excited about because we need, we need the road improvements. We fell behind the curve at one time and, and you know, it just happened and I think now we have an opportunity to make a difference and yeah, I, I say lean and I actually like option two, although you're not asking for that, but I like that. Thank you. Sounds good, thank you. Councilmember Keating. Thank you, Mayor. I, I agree with Councilmember Garland. Definitely lean in on this. I noticed that my zip code has the worst roads in the entire city, so that will be something helpful to be talking about as Councilmember Garland mentions that you know, we're knocking on doors, but this is something that comes up almost every single day, and I think we have a, a you know a modest plan here. Well, a, a, a robust plan for a modest cost to, to the individual citizen to, to get this done faster, and I think that's something that we could definitely take to the public and be proud of once it's finished. So, yeah, absolutely lean in. Thank you. Sounds good. Uh, I totally agree. I mean, this is something that, as both my colleagues said, uh, I hear about constantly when I'm out in neighborhoods or just sort of walking around the community, is there's this desire to see what can we do to actually speed up a lot of our pavement quality um, repairs. But right, but the biggest thing is they talk about they don't want repairs. They'll, I, I will literally have people walk me out in front of their home and say, look, it's obvious that we've patched the street and we've patched it again and we've patched it again. When am I going to get a fresh new coat? out here on my street. And many times, they're not just simply talking about the arterials, even the collectors, they're talking about just the neighborhood streets that are right backing up from their driveway or their garage. Um, people will many times compliment the work that's been done on Warner. And they say, yeah, God, Warner's fantastic. Your team did a great job. How do we get all of our streets in the city of Tempe, including just the neighborhood ones, to look like Warner and to feel like Warner when we're driving them or riding our bicycles? So 
I think whatever we can do to rapidly accelerate uh, addressing all of the pavement in the city and really showing our residents that if you approve something like this in the next four or five years, if your street hasn't been touched for quite some time, you're going to see that fresh new coat, not a patch job, but a completely fresh new street. I think that's something our residents would absolutely want us to lean into. So I completely support doing this. Great. Thank you, Mayor, Council. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, next up, item number five, Committee of the Whole. Uh, there are no items ready for City Council direction or status updates. Uh, item 5B, Council Committees in Progress, updates is needed. Uh, any Council members with any updates on their committees? All right, next item on the agenda is future agenda items. Council members may request that an agenda item be added to a future issue review session. And in accordance with the Arizona Open Meeting Law, there should be no discussion on the item other than to clarify the request. Any council members want a future agenda item added? Okay, no, me either. Next item, mayor's announcements, city manager's announcements. As I try to turn my page here, let's see. City Manager, do you have any announcements this evening? I don't believe I, I think all my announcements are for the regular council meeting at six. Mine are also, thank all you, right. Mayor. Sounds good. All right, well with that said then, that brings us to item number eight, which is adjournment. The next work study session is scheduled for October 19th, 2023, and we are adjourned.